He's gone now. Uh, the sled we saw him playing with has been left outside, abandoned, and we see uh, it gradually covered with snow, uh, almost uh, to suggest the kind of, uh, not merely the events that took place, but in the sense that this remains, well, remains a buried kind of event in his life. Uh, uh, so in one sense, that's why Although none of the people in the, in the film end up understanding what Rosebud is, uh, none of the characters end up, end up understanding what Rosebud is. Um, here, Rosebud is the rediscover, is the name on the sled, and here it is being buried as a, a kind of symbol of, of the way in which his, uh, uh, this event remains at the buried in his, in his unconscious, buried in the in the bottom of his mind. Have a look, though, before we just talk a little bit more generally about the, about the significance of the sequence, have a look at the way in which uh, Wells uses incredibly inventive uh, editing to move from the sequence to the next one, which is where he's already in Boston. Uh, we're not sure exactly which Christmas it is, uh, probably the first one that he spends in Boston, but look at how, how uh, uh, quickly it's cut. Uh, in a normal classic Hollywood film where you want to signify the lapse of time, well, how might you have done it? Well, we could have first of all had them on a train, they're going to catch a train to Chicago and then uh, to the East Coast. Uh, we don't have any of that kind of narrative filling in there which you might expect in a classic Hollywood movie, um, and nor do you have, which is the other alternative available to a classic Hollywood movie, which is a kind of, well, it's a sort of dissolve, but it's a, it's, it's a kind of much more clever dissolve, um, which continues the thematic that Jill has been talking about. Let's have a look at this. <coughs> Charles. Merry Christmas. Merry. So, 
So you get a kind of thematic continuation that, in one sense, uh, uh, yes, he's now in Boston, and now the sled is has been replaced by this one. He opens it, um, but also you start getting a uh, repetition, if you like, or partly a repetition, but also the emergence of this kind of belligerent little boy who seems always to hate uh, authority, to feel himself the kind of victim, victim of authority, and that's conveyed by the, um, by the, the low angle shot here, it's a, it's a film that is full of low angle shots, uh, just as it has a lot of that uh, cinematography we were talking about yesterday, which kind of both positively positions a number of planes in, in space and allows for, as we talked about yesterday, a much more open interpretation of what's going on. Here also in this film, we get this kind of, from now onwards, we get low angle shots, occasionally high angle shots, but lots of low angle shots, which in a sense signify that he is Kane's world is a world in which either you're on top or you're at the bottom. There's nothing, if you like, there's nothing possible in between. So we cut to here, we see he's got a sled. Um, uh, it's obviously not going to have rosebud on it because the top, the top letter is an E there. Um, so it's not the same sled, not the same kind of sled, and he doesn't seem particularly interested in uh, the sled uh, as, as a gift. It's not going to replace the one that he left behind. But watch how, from his position, a kind of subordinate position of uh, this, this little boy who is uh, no longer happy, no longer at home, to the authority figure of Thatcher. No matter how good a, a um, guardian Thatcher is, there's something that has gone wrong here that isn't going to that isn't going to work out. So in other words, nobody's saying Thatcher is this terrible mean man or anything like that. We get no evidence of that. But uh, nevertheless, it was the way in which um, uh, Charlie is taken from his home, that becomes most formative. Yeah, just putting in another sled is in one sense a completely useless gesture because it's not the sled, it's everything that the sled represents that he's lost. And so simply giving him another object to represent that, that kind of profoundly significant object isn't going to work at all. I'm giving back his childhood. Oh, Charles. Merry Christmas. It's this wonderful long. Uh, 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 you can literally sort of feel how long it takes the camera to to reach up to to for Charles to see Thatcher. And there are going to be lots of, as I said, lots of instances of that people towering over other people. Uh, we'll see one, just for example, where Cain himself, because he's been unable to forge this potential for an equal relationship, um, uh, the only way he can uh, get Susan to uh, uh, do what he wants is, as it were, by dominating her. So he, as we will see, becomes the Thatcher in that relationship. And the, the, the sort of uh, you see this on the on those those handouts that are available on Moodle. Um, a sort of most obvious way of interpreting this and the importance of this scene is people have adopted a kind of uh, 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 fairly simplified psychoanalytic approach to this development of Cain, and that is. To pick up on the idea that Freud first uh, uh, ex ex uh, expounded on in when he was inventing psychoanalysis, and that was the way in which, in particular, boy children 
need to, they begin obviously with a close association with their mother. Uh, uh, the mother is the one who feeds them. The mother is the one who cleans them. The mother is the one who takes care of them. But at some point in their career, and that, and that is regarded in Freudian terms as the Oedipal stage, or um, as it were, where, where the child is, is most closely associated with the mother and sees the mother as the uh, object of love and the person who is going to satisfy his or her needs. And what has to happen, of course, is that the boy child, in this case, and we won't go into the gender politics of this here, because it's not really relevant, um, uh, the, the boy child needs to break away from the mother and start identifying with the father. Start identifying with the father, and for Freud, the first step in that understanding is to understand that in the end the mother is not there for him. The mother is, to put it in kind of simple terms, not his lover, not the person who is going to be at his uh, beck and call. And he needs to identify with the father and move from identifying with the mother to identifying with the father. What does that mean? Well, if you have a look here, first of all, um, in this early pre oedipal what I call the pre oedipal stage there, um, uh, the, mother, the child identifies with the mother, has or lives in a world where you get a sense of plenitude and harmony. Everything's in place. I, I'm, I'm hungry. I cry. I get my mother's breath. The world is there fulfilling all of my needs. And uh, it seems as if the world is oriented, I'm at the center of this world, everything takes care of me. Okay. I fit into a natural environment. I'm like, it's as if the world has been made primarily for me. However, when you start identifying with the father, you have to start learning the harder lessons of life, if you like, and that is that the world is not there for you. You've got to accept external authority. You've got to realize that you, everything is not as you necessarily want. You've got to enter into culture, and entering into culture is a life breaking away from that early natural stage and suddenly finding yourself subject to rules. You can do that, you can't do that. You must do this, you, must, you can't do that. Okay. And that means the acceptance of external authority. In this case, as is in the case in most cultures, that external authority tends to be paternal authority. Um, and, and you, you kind of think, well, it's, it's, especially if you're, if you're a woman, you're likely to think, um, yeah, boy children, because they're entering a patriarchal society. A patriarchal society is one where men are more powerful, and so it's a fairly comfortable ride. Uh, they are going to become figures of power. What Freud wants to point out, however, is that even in patriarchal societies, it's a move away from a world in which everything seems perfect for you to one in which there are laws, one in which you have to obey others, one in which there are more powerful men than you. So it becomes a kind, if you like, uh, as much of a struggle for uh, boy children as well to enter into to enter into culture. And entering into culture entails responsibility. It also entails, in terms of what I was talking about earlier, it entails being able to relate to other people as themselves subjects of culture. Not to think that you are the center of that world. And either you are a victim or you are 
the ruler. Entering into culture means understanding that you're somewhere in between those things, that you have to pay your dues in order to get what you want. If you want, if you want to do A, B, C, and B, if what gives you satisfaction, what gives you pleasure is doing A, B, C, and D. The way you have to do that is through following, through following the rules that society has put in place. And the argument that goes about this film is that Cain never manages that transition. It's a kind of botched transition. He never seems to be able to enter the world of patriarchy. He's always kicking against it. He's always suspended, if you like, on the one hand. He's always, on the one hand, he's always kicking against authority. He's fed up with authority. He turns his whole newspaper enterprise into a vehicle for challenging authority. Okay. Um, uh, he can never, no matter, at no stage in his life, does he ever reconcile himself to Thatcher or say uh, thank you for what you've done and so on. He's unable to do that. And at the same time, exercising that, kicking against authority, trying to become powerful, never substitutes for what he's lost. So on the one hand, you see this man who gains everything, but who has also lost everything. And what has he lost primarily? He's lost, he, he's been unable to move away. He keeps on moving, move in a, a, an ordered and sort of managed way from that infantile idea of what, uh, uh, of, of how you relate to the world around you. He's been unable to move and he always wants to find, he always wants to find something to make it right going as far as buying all those things, spending all that money, going to Europe, plundering Europe to bring their artifacts to the United States, building this great uh, pleasure, uh, pleasure dome, this uh, huge house called Xanadu, as a way of maybe constructing an environment where you'll feel happy. But he's never successful in doing that. Both, both Jed Leland, his estranged best friend, and Susan, in their interviews, talk about how he'll be obviously generous, he'll do anything for you, but you have to love him in return. So, clearly, a, a huge gap there, a huge meanness that needs to be, needs to buy people love. Yes, and that's why Jed Leland is so somehow put himself back at the centre of that world that he loves by attempting both to become enormously powerful and the king's ego kind of dominates this world. He's constantly trying to reaffirm, reaffirm his own ego. But also this terrible need to be loved, even if it means bribery, if it means in one way or another by people's love. Okay, so do you want to introduce this conversation? Um, okay, so, so we just it's very clear, I think, that this is a continuation, or this is the beginning of that process. You see, we see him get the sled, we see that the sled is not going to be a, a replacement, because it's not replacing an object, it's replacing an enormously significant loss that that, 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 will, the loss that, that object represents. And then he, he looks up and he says, Merry Christmas, in a, in a very hostile, attractive voice. This, of course, is the dissolve from the snow-covered, the white of the snow-covered sled straight into the white paper that he's unwrapping from the, from the Christmas presents. So that one says a very, a very economical but quite a puzzling transition. No clear, okay, now it's X number of years later and we're in class. And then at the end of the sequence, watch how, how you get an ellipsis of time because that just says, Merry Christmas, and then he says, and a Happy New Year, and it's years later. It's as though he's carrying on the same conversation, which in one sense he is because their relationship never changes. But 
Charles in that, in the, by the end of that sentence, Charles is no longer a little boy, he's about to turn 21 and take, take possession of his empire. So they're getting pretty cheeky into just sort of saying, okay, all these years have passed, and I'm just going to do it in one sentence and one and one cat. So you, yeah, you're yeah, playing kind of catch up as the viewer. You're saying Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and then you say, hey, hey, but it's not the same year, it's, uh, you know, a good 15 years later. Well, Charles, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. And a Happy New Year. In closing, may I again remind you that your 25th birthday, which is now approaching, marks your complete independence from the firm of Thatcher and Company, as well as their... doesn't work on Elijah John because Thompson is going backwards and forwards into three different people. We jump to a much later stage in Hayes' life, which is more during the Depression, where he has lost a considerable part of his empire, and he is in discussion with Bernstein and Thatcher over what they're going to do, over what control he does still retain over his holdings. And but notice that although he's now in this next episode, a middle-aged man, he's still behaving like a little boy when it comes to his Thatcher has by now become a much mellower old man. He's really not such a bad person. He's feeling bad for Charles because Charles has lost all his money. And at the end of the sequence, he says to him, he's trying to draw him out, he's trying to be sympathetic. He says, what would you like to have been? And Charles says, everything you hate. So even as a middle aged man, even as an adult, he's still fighting authority, he's still trying to reassert his ego, his centrality. And there's also in this a conversation about the fact that he's made an enormous amount of money and he invests that he buys things. And again, I think we're supposed to make a connection with that obsessive buy. And it is obsessive because he often never even unpacks them is trying to fill some kind of gap, is trying to meet some kind of unconscious big need. Something that he's lost, that he can never recover, and he's attempting to recover that loss or fill that loss by buying, 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 buying. And then the third thing to look out for in this sequence is again the use of defense photography. And the way in which very clearly the shot composition is supposed to remind us of that scene in the cabin on that traumatic day when that comes to take away. We watch how, as the scene begins, you can't even see Charles at all, and only as the camera pulls back, you see him in the background, and he goes towards and walks and walks because he's got that depth of field. So there is a small figure in the background of the shot, in the center of the shot, and two powerful one powerful authority figure and his and business manager, Bernstein, in the foreground. And again, I think the shot is saying he feels like that little boy again. He's back in that position of powerlessness. And there's so many shots in this, in this movie that pick up on that composition. As he came as a small figure, despite the fact that he was a very powerful, very wealthy man, as a small figure in the background, because he just that he relives and relives and revisits at some unconscious level that time or moment of loss. So it's the, it's the Great Depression which is the cause of his uh, financial setbacks. Um, hence the 1929, we're back here at Thatcher's script. <laughs> Back to the said newspapers, the said Charles Foster King, hereby. It's so clear because you can't in this shot see how deep the field is. We've got somebody in there, we've got Grace in there, it's in the foreground, but it looks as if those windows are not that far behind him. Only once Charles comes into the scene and this shot and starts walking towards them that you realize how big the windows are and how far away. So it's a, it's a very tricky cinematography. You can see that at this point. The 
relinquishes all control thereof. And of the syndicates pertaining thereto, and any and all other newspaper, press, and publishing properties of any kind whatsoever. And agrees to abandon all claims. Which there. means we're bust all right. Well, out of cash. All right, Mr. Bernstein. I read it, Mr. Thatcher. Let me sign it. Oh, too old to call me Mr. Thatcher, Charles. You're too old to be called anything else. You were always too old. In consideration thereof, Thatcher and Company agrees to pay to Charles Foster Kane as long as I he lives. I continue to maintain over your newspapers a large measure of control. Measure of control? And shall sure. seek your advice. This depression. Just by the way, I mean, part of the narrative is that they are a little bit at odds. Thatcher and Kane, because Thatcher represents the uh, East Coast establishment, uh, the the um, the wealth and and, and uh, a power that's associated with that establishment. And when Kane gets his money, the first thing he wants to do, he says, "I'm not interested in 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 all of these investments. I'm interested in that newspaper." the inquirer and the reason why he's interested in that newspaper is because he can use it to get back at Thatcher and he does use it to get back at Thatcher he uses it to expose the trusts to expose uh, corruption um, and so on although we never quite clear how much of it is corruption how much of it is uh, just simply uh, uh, the way in which um, uh, the uh, capital is working, and so they're always at odds. They're on opposite sides of the of the of the spectrum, if you like. They're the the what the 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 um, no, I won't I won't I won't use a a, a, a lot of parallel. Um, but Thatcher, but Thatcher, what Thatcher does is here, as Jill said, he tries to. He tries to um, uh, soften the blood. He does repeat that measure of control, and he really doesn't like the things that that Charles is doing. But he nevertheless tries to soften that blow. And then watch as he makes, even after he's made that gesture of conciliation to Cain. Watch how Cain reacts. Temporary. Always the chance to. Die, Richard, and I will. Sister shall die, Richard, and I was born. We never lost as much as we may. Yes, yes, but your methods. You know, Charles, never made a single investment. Always used money to... To buy things. Hmm. Buy things. My mother should have chosen a less reliable banker. If I hadn't been very rich, I might have been a really great man. Don't you think you are? I think I did pretty well under the circumstances. What would you like to be? Everything you hate. authority of five things like that 
and at the same time feel comfortable with yourself as potential authority or potential carrier of that same authority. So it stays both this capacity, capacity egotistical adult and this damaged little boy all at the same time. Okay, so we jump now to you know, read Thatcher's account of it. And the next person that comes to goes interview is Bernstein, who is the manager. And Bernstein reminisces about the early days of the Empire, when he and James and Dear Leland were three close friends, and the three of them kind of get this little newspaper <coughs> and run out when Kane still seems to be immensely highly listed, and he's going to use his paper to defend the rights of the working man and the rest of them. But for now, I'm going to give you several several examples of the way in which Wells uses completely experimental visual techniques. As Anton said yesterday, one of the reasons why this has become such a famous film is because Wells kind of just tried everything. He did different things with lighting, he broke the rules of the way that we were <coughs> to use studio lighting, he tries different things with, with very, very low angles. So, he used so many experimented with so many different visual techniques that he just opened up the world for, for later filmmakers. People who might never have thought of doing something in a particular way if Wells hadn't completely just broken the rules and started his back. And this, as Anton said yesterday, often somebody says, I saw this film the other day and it's amazing, I've used these very low angles or it's sort of such a blacked out the faces of the characters all together. He said, yeah, yeah, I know, Wells did that 70 years ago. So he was, in that sense, a kind of pioneer of visual techniques and experimental visual techniques. But they're always they're never just there for their own sake. They're always making thematic points, like that, that extraordinary tricksy shot in that opening montage where we see the nurse through the distorting glass of the of the fallen snow. And it's both saying, I'm going to experiment with a very unconventional shot. I'm going to see what it's like to shoot a figure through a convex piece of glass. But it's also linking into that idea that you never see anyone, and certainly never see K, without the distorting effect of somebody else's perspective. You might be seeing them through the prism of someone else's highly subjective. Good. So always on the one hand saying, let's try this, let's try that, let's do something completely unconventional with our lighting or our camera, but always making meaning at the same time. Inviting you to say, why is he doing that? Why is he doing that at this particular moment? What is how does that signify? How can I how can I turn you to understand? And yeah, yeah, what Charles is doing, he still he still is, it seems to be genuinely quite idealistic, he becomes infinitely more cynical later. And he is going to, on the front page, in the first front page of his newspaper, he's going to print this declaration of principles, that they are going to tell the truth in this newspaper, like no one has ever told the truth in the case before, that they are going to give the people of New York what they really, what they really need. Um, and look at how this shot. Wasted, eh? Wasted? Yeah, man. You only made the paper over four times tonight, that's all. I'll change the front page a little, Mr. Bernstein. That's not enough. No, there's something I've got to get into this paper besides pictures and print. I've got to make the New York Enquirer as important to New York as the gas in that light. What are you going to do, Charlie? Declaration of Principles. <laughs> Don't smile to the guy. Got it all written out, Declaration of Principles. You don't want to make any promises, Mr. Kane. You don't want to keep. These are the catch. I'll provide the people of this city with a daily paper that will tell all the news honestly. So you can see here what's going on in terms of the cinematography. And it's clearly very deliberate uh, that Kane's head is in darkness. The person speaking is in darkness while we can see his two friends, Bernstein and and um, Leland, we can see them very clearly, but the person supposedly saying, making the statement, saying what this newspaper is going to do, his face is in darkness. So a cinematographic technique, which is both fairly uh, unusual, much more expressionistic 
than uh, realistic, and we're not given the opportunity to read his face, uh, to see what, uh, um, what his expression is or anything like that. Instead, the cinematography kind of alerts us to the uh, uh, whether what he's saying is actually <coughs> either what he does or what in the end um, he, he actually intends without realizing it. I mean, at one level, Cain believes in himself and what he's saying. At another level, he doesn't understand, he doesn't seem to understand that really he's mainly interested in his own ego and in boosting himself and making the world his own environment. He's not as interested in serving as his manifesto uh, suggests. As his friend points out, he says in a moment, that's two sentences you started with the word I. <laughs> Says he himself remains absolutely enigmatic at what, in a different kind of way, <coughs> in a, a key moment where you're invited to identify with him, in a different sort of film, we probably have got a close up of him at this stage, making his declaration, committing himself to his principles. Well, also, that's the second sentence you started with I. People are going to know who's responsible. Now they're going to get the truth in the inquirer quickly and simply and entertainingly, and no special interests are going to be allowed to interfere with that truth. I'll also provide them with a fighting and tireless champion of their rights as citizens and as human beings. Signed. Now that, Charlie. I'm going to print it. Sally! Yes, Mr. King. Here's an editorial, Sally. I want you to run it in the box on the front page. This morning's front page, Mr. King? That's right, Sally. That means we're going to have to remake again, doesn't it, Sally? Yeah. You better go down and tell them. All right. Sally, when you're through with that, I'd like to have it back. I'd like to keep that particular piece of paper myself. Of course, he does. <coughs> Leland does get it back. And he keeps it. At this stage, he thinks he keeps it. I mean, at this stage, he doesn't understand Cain that well and, and believes what Cain is saying. So he sort of says, this is going to be the moment at which we together formed this newspaper that was going to crus crusade for the working man, was going to defend the ordinary person against uh, established uh, capital and power. And he believes it. Though, later on, later on, he returns the statement to that to, to Cain, and he returns it to Cain precisely at the moment, precisely at the moment that he realizes that Cain is not interested in telling the truth. Cain is interested in imposing what he believes on the world around him. Then we go to Jed Leland's narratives, and one of the things that Jed talks about is Kane's first marriage. And one of the most famous sequences in this film, one of the most lacking sequences, is what we used to call the breakfast table montage. And what, what, what Wells does is he shows us the deterioration of Kane's marriage to Emily, simply through giving us a set of links little vignettes of the two of them at the breakfast table. Starting with them in the early part of their marriage, very much in love, they've been partying all night, they haven't even been to bed yet, and he's telling you how beautiful she is. To, at the end, they seriously quite a strange picture. The clever thing about this is that he does a lot of the work simply through the music. We do hear their conversation getting more and more fussed out. Mostly, I mean, look at, first of all, they start out quite close together at a small table. Then they end up sitting at either end of a much bigger table. And look at the way that as they get more and more strange, more and more objects intervene between them on the table, kind of separating them. And look particularly at, at Emily's clothes and Emily's hairdos and how she starts out looking really quite soft and feminine. And as she gets angrier and angrier with the hair, more and more strange with them. When the air gets more severe, the clothes get more severe, and by the end of the shot, of the, by the final shot, there are these 
very upright candlesticks. Everything is upright and rigid and angry. And so much of the meaning in this is, as I said, just carried by the changes in the music like, scene, in what they're wearing, in particularly what she's wearing, how she looks. And the final, the final kind of relation between the stranger between them is where they're sitting at either end of this plum table, each reading the newspaper, he's reading the inquirer, his paper, and she's reading the chronicle. The rival paper. It's an absolute gesture of, of rejection. In one sense, his marriage is meant to be, if you like, the final legitimation of his entry into the American elite, because, uh, as we're told, um, his his wife is the niece of the president, so it's, as it were, one final attempt for him to become integrated into that uh, American elite, but it fails. Um, it fails, and uh, part of the failure in the end is also, if you like, a kind of political failure, a failure for them to see eye to eye as he continues to, to uh, battle uh, any authority that is around him. Okay. And he runs for governor on an anti-corruption ticket. And 
<coughs> a platform which has to do with revealing his rival, Boston Gates, as, as corrupt, as, as a bad politician. And at this point, again, Leland's still wearing the news of Kay. So Leland is clearly being his campaign manager. He's going around, he's, he's lobbying on Kay's behalf, and he's lobbying for him as the champion of the workers. Later, an angry disillusioned leader will, will realize that, again, Kay just wants the working class to love him. He wants to be a fairy godfather so that he gets their gratitude and their, and their love. It's actually got nothing to do with them, it's got everything to do with him. And that, I think, is, is a picture that, again, in the cinematography. Look at the, again, at the use of low angles here. There's a, there's a wonderful shot which shows Kane sort of rising up on the podium. Um, a low angle shot which is not about power, it's about ego. <laughs> about how big he wants to be, how big he sees himself to be. But there are a number of shots in this, in this sequence that are worth that are very carefully done and worth looking at. And also you can see the difference between, if you like, their approaches to politics. Leland is very much the idealist. Here he is kind of standing on a outside in the street corner, some banners, trying to rally ordinary people for uh, uh, to support Cain, and look again now it's one of those very quick intercuts uh, where it's as if the dialogue continues but suddenly we get to one of the major uh, rallies that Cain himself has organized and you get in the juxtaposition of the two kinds of politics the ordinary everyday if you like street politics of of this scene to the uh, performance politics of uh, uh, Cain himself. This is another one of those ones where the sentence sort of continues, a bit like the Merry Christmas <coughs> and then a Happy New Year, some 18 years later. Here, <coughs> starts the sentence and Cain carries it up. There is only one man who can rid the politics of this state of the evil domination of Boss Jim Geddes. Hooray! I am speaking of Charles Foster Kane, the fighting liberal, the friend of the working man, the next governor of this state, who entered upon this campaign with one purpose only. Interesting that the first chapter you get is not Kane, but this enormous election poster of him. To point out and make public the dishonesty, the downright villainy of boss Jim W. Geddes' political machine, now in complete control of... There was an answer there, right? Hitler. <laughs> yes, the Nuremberg ranks. Not as enormous, but all those museum shots of, of Hitler, the demagogue in Nuremberg, addressing these huge crowds, haranguing them, and getting all this ammunition in return. And I think that shot's very, very deliberately composed to, to evoke Nuremberg, and, and so it's slightly to evoke Hitler. Another very successful populist. <coughs> And then we kind of get a reminder of the, of the difference, as it were, between Cain, as Cain sees himself, this enormous, successful, this, this dominant image in the poster, and the really quite small figure at the bottom of the poster. Well, the, the Cain who is, you know, is still quite a damaged person, quite, a, quite an intellectual at one level person, because he's always going to end by and his own Until a few weeks ago, I had no hope of being elected. <laughs> now, however, I have something more than a hope. <laughs> Jim Geddes! Jim Geddes has something less than a chance. <laughs> A 
similar, a similar point uh, to what Jill has already made. You do get the juxtaposition here, but also then a kind of low angle shot. And just think about how different that shot is to the way in which our general sense of Leland talking to uh, uh, talking to um, uh, that small crowd of supporters is. Here, very much a kind of politics as, well, a kind of fascist politics, a politics as a politics of arrested development, a politics where you either love or hate, um, uh, not a politics of, of reasonable debate. And it's really quite extraordinary to find this in an American film uh, where uh, generally people would have argued that American politics is politics, it's a democratic politics, it's a politics of, of rational debate, um, not a politics of, of um, uh, kind, a politics of either, either of, e yeah, of ego and uh, We've seen, of course, in recent years, in the past American election, for example, the way in which this kind of populist politics has uh, re-emerged in, uh, in American culture. But in that sense, a kind of diagnosis of, an interesting sort of diagnosis of, of populist politics, and a kind of linking populist politics to a misunderstanding of culture, to a kind of botched sort of development where people on both sides, because after all there are these serried ranks of people all, all uh, wanting to support Kane. So it's not only Kane himself, but also those supporters who want this almost kind of infantile engagement. They want a leader, they want someone who will tell them what to do, they want someone who will save them, just like Kane wants his mother back. And for uh, so you're getting a kind of diagnosis of that populist politics in this in this film, and a kind of sense that that populist politics is, at the cultural level, a, a similar version to it's it's a society that hasn't grown up in the same way that Kane himself has never managed to grow up to. Uh, uh, as it were, realize that the world is filled with other people who have different needs, who are different from you, and who also need to uh, be recognized. You are not, the world is not just simply there for you or your group. But anyway, his political ambitions are partly about the fact that he's caught with Susan, his mistress, that his rival, John Davis, finds out about his relationship with Susan and uses it. I mean, it's, again, it's amazing how contemporary all these things are. There's a sex scandal, and because there's a sex scandal, he loses the form of candidacy. No, he doesn't get forward. He, he loses the election very badly because he loses support from the very public. And Jed, his, his, his close friend, is. Uh, <coughs> is deeply disappointed in him. Jed feels, Jed really believed him. Jed believed that Kay was selflessly devoted to the cause of reform, to the cause of improving the lot of the workers, and he can't forgive him for sacrificing that or for throwing that away because he wanted to have a bit of a thing on the side. He wanted to do this. And we get this wonderful scene where they, they quarrel after the loss of the election. They're standing in what was the campaign headquarters. It was all done up really for a celebration, but there was no celebration because the game was lost. And so there's sort of streamers rather busily dangling down. And what Wells does here is he uses very extreme language. So in fact, had to cut, cut holes in the floor in order to get the camera low mm -hmm. enough to get those extreme angles. Show that as they quarrel, as they kind of have moments where they seem to be beginning to understand each other, and then Kane's, Kane's obstinacy, Kane's ego again kind of kicks in and moves away from Jed, they get smaller and larger in relation to each other. So at one point you'll see there's this Jed seems absolutely tiny, and all you can see of Kane is this huge leg in the foreground of the of, of the um, picture. And at that 
point, Jay is talking on behalf of what he calls the little man. And there's a wonderfully witty kind of visual analogue of that, as he momentarily is very small in the picture and came so huge that all you can see is this gate from about waist down. And then came to look more reasonable and they come together and they seem to be the same height and then came and walks away and again that, that sort of stubborn ego makes him get bigger and bigger as he gets further and further away from one person who's prepared to tell the truth to you and to speak honestly and critically to you. Just also a point about the cinematography. Two things that had to be specially done in order to film a sequence like this. Things that the studio would have found surprising. And the one is that they had to, I have already mentioned this, had to make kind of holes in the floor so that the camera could be low enough to get the right low angle shot. Okay, and the other thing of course is when you've got low angle shots you need ceilings because you start seeing the roof all the time. And that, it might seem odd to you, but of course when you're building sets in a studio lot, in a, in a huge warehouse, most of the time you don't need ceilings. In fact, what you've got over the top are microphones and lights and so on. All you need is the walls, because we don't normally walk around looking up at ceilings. And um, here they had to construct the ceilings, uh, especially because the camera was going to be at that low angle. And then finally, just to do, to emphasize that contrast between this kind of filmmaking and classic Hollywood filmmaking, classic Hollywood filmmaking presents us with this world where we interact with people as if we were their equals, as if we are participating in the events or observing the events around us. The people are like us, we are like them, we feel things like identification with them, or anger with them, uh, we dislike some people, we like other people, but it's very much this kind of uh, uh, horizontal relationship. They are like us, we are like them. That is the world, the space that classic Hollywood creates. Here, we're never certain what the space is. Who's on top? Who's at the bottom? There's no equality, if you like, in the cinematography. Rather than having this level, we have these ups and downs, these low and high endings. Besides, you now get drunk. 
You used to write an awful lot about the working man. Oh, go on, turning into something called organized labor. You're not going to like that one little bit when you find out it means that your working man expects something as his right, not as your gift, Charlie. When your precious underprivileged really get together, oh boy, that's going to add up to something bigger than your privilege, and I don't know what you'll do. Sail away to a desert island, probably, and lord it over the monkeys. I wouldn't worry about it too much, Jed. There'll probably be a few of them there to let me know when I do something wrong. Mm. Uh, first. William, William Raynor first did something similar. He 
built an elaborate theater for business pursuits and mathematics. So there's a there's kind of direct reference there. Chandelier? You wanted me to make sure that you got this personally. Thanks. Yes, sir. Is that something from him? Charlie! It's okay, she can tell you. You ought to have your head examined. Sending him a letter telling him he's fired with a $25,000 check in it. What kind of fire do you call that? You did send him a check for $25,000, didn't you? So he fires. Uh, Jed Leland, because Jed Leland, well, he's drunk because he's trying to write an honest review, and the honest review is going to be one that's extremely critical of Susan Alexander's uh, debut, um, and he sends, the ch but he fires him with a check of $25,000, which in 1945, or 46, um, What's the year? Oh, then, okay. Would be would have been an enormous amount of money, and um, uh, he just tears the check up, sends it back, and includes that declaration of principles which Kane had originally signed. This Kane quote was a nice, we're blatantly lying to the public, saying that Susan is a great singer, that her audience was wild for her, that she made this enormous success for me. <laughs> they took that declaration that they were told the absolute truth that they would have public needed. Yes. I sent him a check for twenty five thousand dollars. She's tall I can sit down. What's that? Declaration of principles. What? Here's how she sings from her words. Nancy. You're not so funny, aren't you? Well, I can tell you one thing, you're not going to keep on being funny and that's not my sin. I'm through. I never want to do it in the first place. Continue with your singing, Susan. I don't propose to have myself made ridiculous. You don't propose to have yourself made ridiculous. Go into that's uh, one of the most famous Hollywood montages I uh, ever constructed. Um, it's a set of a, a linking a series of, of shots that are linked together to tell us about uh, Susan's operatic career after Kane has insisted that she um, that she go ahead with the career. He's forced her to do that. And look at how how Wells has interlinked uh, a range of a range of images. There are images of Susan singing, uh, there are images of the newspapers, because he owns all these newspapers across the country, kind of falsely praising her. There are images of, um, of uh, Cain himself as he looms like the authority figure, and then there are images of the stage lights 
and the way in which um, stage lights, flash cameras, that kind of thing, and look at how he intertwines those to give us this uh, much more complex Hollywood montage than you would get, say, in Casablanca. In Casablanca, the Hollywood montage is like a gathering of a set of sequences which will tell us what happened to Rick and Ilsa in Paris. But it all takes place at one level. There's nothing metaphoric. This has got metaphorical images in it. And in the Hollywood montage in Casablanca, it's strictly uh, chronological. The one thing happens after the other. And so we know where they started. We know where they end up. And while this is also chronological, uh, uh, the final images are metaphoric rather than uh, realist. If you look carefully, you'll try and stop on one of the He doesn't just use one superimposition. So, I mean, sometimes you'll have Susan singing very, very badly and superimposed on that in newspaper headlines saying Susan Alexander triumphs <coughs> in Chicago. But at other times, there are actually three images superimposed. So, you'll have Susan on the stage. The newspaper and Kane's face on top of that, so that you're getting a sense of both of her singing, of how the newspapers are being used to falsely, falsely support that singing, and Kane's face himself, giving you the link between him and his power as a newspaper mogul, his manipulation of the news, and the reality that that news is so, so falsely reporting. So they're very, very complex relationships going on. And at other times, as Anton says, you get these, these lights going off, and Susan, I think, experiencing her career as just this incredibly stressful <coughs> being in the limelight all the time. And those superimposed over, sometimes not one, but two other images. So if you sort of freeze this at any point, you'll find at least two, and often three, images on the screen at the same time, and you can ask what's the connection, what's the connection between what's happening on stage, and the newspaper's saying, and this close-up of Kane, very rare close-up, but a close-up looming there in his capacity as powerful newspaper mogul. Not a close-up of a husband watching his wife sing and caring about her and loving her. Making a completely different, much more metaphorical, much more thematic point. Which 
she's as quickly hushed up as in. She came from that very she was, she was just stressed and exhausted, so she took the wrong and she took the wrong words. Yeah, we're going to be no newspaper scandals of one came to one. Okay. So that that's been that's been Susan's story um, uh, when she finally um, Thompson, the reporter, finally does get to to interview her, and she tells her story, and we get that visual uh, reproduction of of the key events in her story, and then finally he goes off to Xanadu to meet the butler, the butler who. Michael Butler's has some interesting inside information, um, though not before asking for a bit of money before he tells the reporter. And he gives us this account of Susan leaving. Am I right? Yeah, he's a butler. Um, Xanadu, this uh, palace in Florida.
memory to do this now. Okay, Thank <laughs> you. 